Paris is a, uh, runs an amazing team uh, and also basic, one of the basic leads of the Docker community in Greece. Pari, welcome. Thank you very Paris much. Paris get back to sleep with infrastructure as code. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for spending your morning with me today. Stavros, thank you for the warm words. Um, I really love what Stavros is doing, and congratulations for your new space that you opened right now. We're neighbors right now. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a story about how you can get, get back to sleep as a developer sysadmin uh, with infrastructure as code. So first of all, once upon a time, there were two innocent kids that decided to do a workshop about Docker Swarm, and they had to create tens of uh, virtual machines by hands for the attendees of the workshop to use. Okay, does this work? Okay. <laughs> so it took them one full-time day to do so, to create the virtual machines for the attendees. But it was totally worth it, as it was the necessary pain for the enormous gain that they were expected to get out of this. A stellar workshop that everything is gonna, was going to work flawlessly and frictionlessly. And the day of that six-hour workshop came. They were super excited about what was about to happen. But at the middle of the workshop, they realized that they had misconfigured their virtual machines. Um, nothing would work. The workshop couldn't take place. And that was it. They didn't have enough time to fix the misconfigured VM because they would have to delete 50 virtual machines by hand and then create 50 virtual machines again by hand with the correct configuration, hoping that this time would really be correct. The workshop sank, the attendees left, rightfully furious, of course, and the company refunded the tickets, the reputation of the company got obliterated, the company shut down operations in just a month, and that was it. And that's sad. But also that actually never happened because we did nothing by hand that day. We used Terraform. We did misconfigure our virtual machines, actually, but we fixed them in a few seconds. It's good. You should use it too. Thanks for your time. OK, I'm joking. I'm not leaving. I have, you're not that lucky because I have a bad reputation of talking a lot. So I hope. How much time do I have? 20 minutes more? OK, OK. Damn. OK, so that was a bad joke, definitely. Anyway, this is me. My name is Paris Kassidiaris. You can find me on Twitter as Paris Kassid. I desper desperately beg you to follow me, because none does. So what I did is I co-founded with a few friends a company called Sourceler. What we do is we provide development environments for in the cloud that you can use in your browser so you don't have to download any tools to work on your web applications. And we also co-organize the Docker Athens user group. You can go to docker.gr to find the meetup. We have a new event coming at the new space of the Cube at 11th of April. Um, uh, 11th of April, yeah, that year, of course. And sorry, great. I hope. <laughs> anyway, so and I hate touching our production infrastructure because every time I do so, I completely mess things up. So let's talk about infrastructure. What is infrastructure? What is infrastructure? So when we talk about infrastructure, especially in the scope of this um, here of this talk, we talk about all the resources that we need to run our applications in production, in development, it doesn't actually matter that much. So, of course, we mean computers, whether that is virtual machines in the cloud or whether we're talking about bare metal services running on premises, this is one of the things that we will deal, deal with. So, the next thing that we will deal, deal with is network interfaces, whether that's floating IPs, SDN interfaces, blah, 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 you know the drill. Okay, storage, which is a really important stuff. Block storage, object storage, where we store the data of our customers and our users, and blah, blah. So that's what we call infrastructure in the scope of this presentation. Let's talk about what we mean about code. What is code? Basically, basically code is machine-readable text. It's text that we humans write, but it's um, despite that we do write that text, it's meant 
to be read primarily by their computer to do what we say the computer to, to do. And what is infrastructure as code? First of all, before I move to the next slide, is anyone here um, using infrastructure as code in their companies? Can you raise your hand? Okay, we, we have a few. That's fine because that makes my presentation less pointless. <laughs> okay, so what we mean about infrastructure as code, we mean about infra infrastructure resources like virtual machines, like network interfaces, blah, 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 what I said before, as machine readable text. And what does that look like? So in case you can see that, this is an example of why we can write uh, infrastructure as code. We, here I'm saying that I want a DigitalOcean droplet. I give it a name. Um, I assign it a region which is, um, which is sourced by a variable. I say what's the image of the virtual machine I want to use. So basically these are attributes that I normally would set via the, digi the DigitalOcean uh, user interface, but described as code in a format that looks like JSON, but it's not quite like JSON. It doesn't matter, and though this is the, the um, big picture of what I'm talking about. So, okay. What are the building blocks of infrastructure as code? Before we understand what it is and how we can get back to sleep with that, we have to understand from what is it comprised as a tool. As a okay, first of all, declarations. What are declarations? When I am... Describing my infrastructure as code, first of all, I have to declare the different types of infrastructure resources that I want to have, I wish to have. And this is what we call a declaration, which is exactly the same screen that I showed you, showed you, be, showed you before. Here I'm describing a droplet, which is a virtual machine, actually. I can describe um, whatever my cloud provider gives me the, the right to do so. I can have dependencies, blah, 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 blah. Next is a state. The state is what I do actually get from what I, um, I say to my tool, I wish. So before, here, I'm saying what I wish to have. I wish to have a virtual machine, blah, 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 blah. But here, my tool has returned me the state of my actions, what I actually get, which you can see it has an ID, it has a definite um, IPv4 ad address. This is the outcome of my tool. And I have the operator, which is basically the program that will give flesh and bones to the machine-readable text that I have written to my code. Actually, what it does is it takes my declarations, what I wish to have, and makes it, and it makes it actual resources. So how does that look like? We at our company are using Terraform. Terraform is a tool by a company called uh, HashiCorp, but it's not the only infrastructure as code tool that you can use. I'm just showing that for the sake of the example because this is what we know to, you, to use in production. So what you would usually do, you would put your code describing your infrastructure in a repository and then you would use a tool that you would have to initialize to parse your code and understand what you need. Here I can see that I need a DigitalOcean provider, so it's like a plugin to create my DigitalOcean resources. I need a template provider which is basically a text transformation tool so I can avoid repeating myself with my configuration. Here I can plan the changes in my infrastructure, which is, for example, here I want to create three virtual machines from what you can see. I can apply these changes and actually create my infrastructure. And finally, if I don't need these tools, I can, I can destroy what I want to create with a single command. So as I said, there are pl plenty of tools to use. You can use CloudFormation of AWS. You can use the ARM templates, Nazar, OpenStack, Heat, Ansible. Maybe you know some of these, maybe not. But you can definitely Google them and see how they work. So why? We saw a few things about infrastructure as code, but why should I use that? What's the point? First of all, what we get when we treat our infrastructure as a code base is that we control risk. What does that mean? This is something that I actually said in 2017. Oh shit, I think I just nuked a production server by mistake. And I really nuked a production server because I thought I was touching something else and then I deleted something that I didn't have to, I, didn't, I, I shouldn't delete actually and shit happened. But this cannot actually happen if in order to change something in my infrastructure I have to create a pull request in GitHub and have it reviewed and see what are the 
what's going to happen after I do this change and blah, blah, blah. We cannot afford mistakes in, produ in production infrastructure, especially, especially when we have their customer data. We cannot afford doing things by mistake that will delete data or have any other disastrous result. We people were, are, and will always be doing mistakes, especially me. I always do. I really, and uh, my colleagues are always tortured by my personality. But instead of trying to change myself, because, I mean, I always try to get better, but at some point I usually hit the ceiling. Uh, anyway, <laughs> we can use tools to, to actually save us from ourselves and from our mistakes. Anyway, going forward. The next reason that we have, w that we should use infrastructure as code is saving time. What I mean? For automation to make sense, we need volume. And when I say volume, I mean that when we just want to update, update one, two, three, four VMs, five by hand, or versus Terraform, it doesn't say much. I'm going to spend really much time s setting up all these infrastructure as code things compared to um, just going to the UI and doing the changes. But when I have to apply changes to 40 virtual machines, or if I even have four virtual machines, but I have to apply times multiple times in a day because I want to try some new infrastructure, yeah, this is when we start to talk about volume and when it makes sense to use tools that let us handle our infrastructure as code. And the last reason that I find it really, really important is auditing. What does that mean? Do you remember what is the last tuning that you performed on your production application servers? Or when or why you did it? Well, I guess not. I don't. I'm not a freak. I mean, I don't have a crazy memory or something like that. But can you look for it? Can you search? Can you find what was the last change that you did at your servers and why you did it? We can, because we, we are manipulating our infrastructure as code. We can go to GitHub, we can see our pull requests, we can see when we increase the number of our servers, we can see when we updated the image of our virtual machines, and so on. But in case, in case you are still looking for a real world use case, true story ahead. This is what happened a month ago. So last month, we migrated all of our source layer infrastructure to a new data center, to a new cloud provider. Let me guide you through what we had to migrate. So first of all, our computers. We have five different VM types and multiple of them in number. So we have load balancers. We use load balancers so we can route incoming traffic to our products, to our applications. On our service, we are also kind of hosting applications of our users, so we have a different set of computers to load balance incoming traffic for our users to their containers. We also have application VMs where we run the, up, actu the actual code of our applications, of our products. We have database virtual machines. Um, more specifically, we are using MongoDB as our product, so we have actually a MongoDB replica set which is deployed with infrastructure as code and has many, many gigabytes of data that we had. And we have what we say swarm managers, which are managing our Docker swarm cluster. And we have multiple block storage devices for our data, our customers' data. We have multiple Docker swarm services that, that are running um, our products inside, and so on. So I actually forgot to put here Boromir. I really wanted to do so. Anyway, one simply does not regret such a payload by crossing their fingers and saying that, OK, I'm just going to move terabytes of data from one data center to the other one just by doing click and click and click. So we had to iterate on provisioning, testing, and destroying our infrastructure. When we have to move the data of our customers that are paying us money to keep them there safe, we can't just do things and hope that they will work. We really had to create a first set of the new infrastructure, move there a sample of the data, move there our, uh, copy their applications, see what works, what not, do another test, destroy everything, then start over, blah, 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 blah. This is not fast or cheap. 
Imagine having to create tens of block storage devices, doing so again when you have to change the file system for an old one to a new one to see if this works. It's not easy. And if we really were doing all these things by hand, we would still be testing these things right now, which is the, the end of March. And we would still be paying more than twice the price for our infrastructure, because the previous infrastructure provider that we had had more than double the price of our current, current one. So what we did save is money, time, and actually, we got much more confidence. So instead of, you, of doing all these things by hand, we used Terraform. We provisioned, tested, and destroyed multiple clusters in minute. While we were using Terraform, we were able to create about 10 different um, server types, about 20 block storage devices, um, that much network interfaces in a minute, see if they work because we have all our services in Docker images, so we were actually able to, to deploy them in minutes there and see if they work. And this gave us actually the confidence to perform such a migration, terabytes of data, multiple different server types, um, 30 different uh, Docker Swarm services in just a fraction of time. So the day we migrated, all of our infrastructure from the old infrastructure provider to the new one, we went back to sleep. And we slept tight, really, really, really tight. And that was it. I actually finished quite faster than expected. But I have to share one more thing with you. How does one convert a pseudocode file to Python? Does anyone know here? You just that. The .py extension to the file name. <laughs> okay, that was a worse joke than the ones um, said before. Um, in general, we we mess a lot with infrastructure at at our company. We we really like. I mean, infrastructure is one of the things that people hate to touch most of the time because you have a huge responsibility when you're dealing with your own servers. But despite that, we we like trying stuff and doing new things with infra infrastructure and anyway, trying to find ways to optimize that, make it faster and cheaper for us to do things on infrastructure. And infrastructure as code and the tool called Terraform that we're using is really, really helping us do that. So if you want to learn more about what we're doing about that, you can check out that website. It's 2hog.codes. This is, this is a website where we publish content about what we are doing, considering infrastructure and all the things that we are doing in our company. We have some workshops there. We have a blog with articles about the way we work. And that was it, actually. I didn't expect it to, to finish so quick. Thank you very much. I hope it wasn't tiring. OK, so we can either go and have some questions, or because I finished a bit early, I can go back to the code and have a more deep dive about how the thing works. Hands up oh. for code. Hands up for questions. Hands up for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's time. All right, we'll take, we'll take one or two questions, um, and then we'll go for lunch. OK. Any plans to become containerized and avoid migrating by being highly available? OK, first of all, uh, all of our services are containerized. Everything runs in Docker containers. But when, OK, so we have a, a special category for product. Sourceler is a completely stateful product. We have uh, block storage devices with an actual file system where we store the files of our customers. So this is not something that you can, I mean, whether your application is running in containers or not, the data is there, and you have to migrate it somehow. And this cannot happen magically in, um, what can I say, um, with a re re reliable way right now. You have to do that by hand. Do you let your CI run your infrastructure as code? Oh, yeah, great question. Not, no, but we will do. Uh, we haven't done yet. But if, if you have checked out GitHub Actions, which is um, it's a new feature by GitHub that allows you to run small containers when you push new commits in GitHub and stuff. It has uh, a plugin, let's say, for Terraform. Um, 
we would really like to do that, and we will do so. Not yet, but we will. Next. Does uh, updating the virtual machines done while they are running? If so, how that can be handled? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So in our case, this cannot happen because our services are stateful. Our product, actually, is stateful. So we, I mean, there's no way to transfer terabytes of block storage volumes from one data center to another uh, without downtime and reliably. So what we did is, okay, the, the first one is my favorite question. Okay, so um, what we did is we said, okay, this Sunday the product is gonna be offline and we just did the migration with one day of uh, downtime. It was less, but we scheduled one day of downtime. downtime. Um, are you guys happy with Docker Swarm? Yeah, we're very, very happy with Docker Swarm. I intentional, intentionally didn't mention the word Kubernetes in my presentation because I think we had enough of it today, but yeah, it works fantastic. It, we don't miss any features. Um, we light much less configuration than we do with Kubernetes. Yep. How does it differentiate we, from Helm charts? Okay, so I guess we're talking about Terraform. The thing with, uh, so you're using Helm charts to deploy services in Kubernetes. You're using Helm charts to deploy applications, actually. MySQL, Postgres, your own applications, and so on. What you use Terraform for is to manage actual infrastructure with flesh and bones. I mean, you can't describe a network interface with Helm charts. I mean, unless you're using some uh, quite weird um, Kubernetes um, extension or network interface. But anyway, yeah, that's the difference. I mean, sometimes you can't, sometimes you just have to manage your underlying infrastructure, servers, block storage devices, um, load balancers, um, DNS records, and yeah, you have to know that these are on Azure or on AWS and stuff. So yeah, what is Kubernetes and Helm for your services is Terraform for your virtual machines. Okay, do we have any other questions? Okay. I believe it's lunchtime. Lunchtime? I guys, thank lunchtime. you very much for spending your time All with me. All right, you. guys. Cheers. Okay.